You're listening to Tabletop Arcanum, a podcast dedicated to learning and exploring the hobby of tabletop gaming. Your hosts are Justin Taylor and Richard Geese, so sit back and relax as we talk, discuss, and joke our way through the hobby we love so much. Welcome to episode three of Tabletop Arcanum. I'm sitting here with Justin. And I am, of course, Ricky. Uh, we're coming at you with all kinds of different board game terms this episode. Correct. Um, and be- um, before we jump in, uh, what have you been up to since our last episode? What games have you played? I've been playing a decent amount of games, personally. Uh, made more headway into Pandemic Legacy than I talked about in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, last time we were in... End of June, going into July, like the halfway point in the year. We are now through the end of September, by the way. Light spoiler alert, there's a couple rough months that things happen and you don't... Yeah, you're not You're not even ready for it. Plot twists happen. It's like that ah, winter is coming feeling of like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, no. Just out of nowhere, out the woodwork. Like a Kool-Aid man busts through the door and that's what happens. So, been playing a little bit of that. What I actually did is, with my friendly local gaming store, they asked me to go to the Alliance Open House in lovely Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, So a buddy of mine and I drove out there and had a blast at this trade show for retailers. It was developers all over the place throwing their product literally at us and going hey look at us you want to order this and seeing what third fourth quarter and even what some of the next year stuff is coming up so there was a lot to be said in there um i could probably go on for a couple hours based on the fact that it was like at 8 a.m to midnight every for for like three days uh, some really good stuff is in the pipeworks fantasy flight having the exclusive distribution channel with alliance had a very strong presence Got more Keyforge information about how um, competitive deck tournaments are going to happen. I didn't tell this to you yet, but there's a couple interesting formats. So one of them is the Gauntlet, where you bring two decks, and you play with either deck you want until one loses. And then that deck is out, and you can only play with the other deck. Interesting. The other format that they were talking about was a like a deck trading swapping mechanic where I play my deck against yours, and then round two we switch decks. I play yours, you play mine. Um, and there's like a best of three sort of uh, route there. So like they had a presence, got to play a little bit more Arkham Horror because they're all part of the Asmodee brand. Uh, Gen 7 was there, which I got to play at Gen Con, and I, I literally dragged my friend over and like we're playing this and demoing this game because this is amazing. That game Discovery mm-hmm. that they were talking about, the unique game rule, they had that actually out and we got to see oh, nice. that a little bit. So that was not one of the neat things, is getting to see these games before they actually come out. Um, Simon brought out Gizmos, a couple other games. AEG was a big presence with Smash Up and War Chest. Uh, War Chest just recently dropped in stores. Uh, Smash Up next year is the international tour. So we're going to see a lot of different Smash Up things, um, including the kit that's going to be coming out, which features penguins. Because mm. all their expansions, they realized halfway through the, the development cycle, or most way through the development cycle, that they've hit every liter- literally every continent except Antarctica. So they made the event kit Antarctica themed. Fair enough. Yeah. There is some really neat stuff coming in. Osprey Games has one called Cryptic, which is a very much a deduction hidden information game where there's a creature like a Loch Ness monster. It's all hex based and abstract looking, but there's a. Is it exclusively Loch Ness or is it like a cryptid? It's a cryptid. It's like this weird creature we're trying to find. I'm on board with that. Um, The cool thing is, you're going to have a piece of information about the cryptid. Mm-hmm. Your information is going to be like it is on mountains or water. I'm going to have a different piece of information, and each player will have a different little rule that this that its mm-hmm. habitat is. Or maybe it has to be near bears, or maybe it has to be within these structures or buildings that are placed on the board. All of these rules will 
to note one legal hex. There's one spot that all the rules will say this is true. But we're going around the circle saying, according to your clue, is the cryptic here? And I put a little cube on a hex on the board and you go, no. And you put a little marker saying that is incorrect. And we keep kind of deducing until we all start figuring out each other's rules. And the first player to go, I believe it's here. I put my yes marker on it. Next player goes, yep, yeah, according to my rule, it's true. And then you, according to you, it's true here too. Mm -hmm. And that's how you win the game. So like, it's a neat little deduction game um, that eventually someone's going to win because there's only going to be so many variants of that. There is uh, a Judge Dread game coming out. Uh, I believe that was also by Osprey, which uh, looked pretty interesting. I am the law. Exactly. Yeah, I'm excited. That, I'd be down for that too. I got to demo Scorpius Trader, which is coming up from AEG, uh, very sci-fi, uh, Rondel style thing. And for mm -hmm. those listening, if you don't understand the word I just said, we are going to cover that later. Yeah, it was a lot of games, and I would totally do it 100% again. It was a lot of fun um, talking to developers, talking to them, um, and learning a little bit more about the the their side of the industry which i haven't really been exposed to in all of these years as far as where they come from and what they do for retailers versus their distributors versus chan it's a whole nother world it's like it's an it's amazing so a really good opportunity for me to to jump out on there so i got to play a lot of stuff with that in mind but for the most part it's been a little light i did have a we played uh fifth edition oh yeah last yeah. week yeah we played some D D last week uh, I ran my, my bi-weekly D&D game um, two days after that. But I had a um, Legend of the Five Rings tournament at the mm -hmm. local store um, in that weekend, too. So, been busy. Been busy. Yeah. Um, so, other than the D&D the game that we both sat at, um, what did you do in the last couple weeks since we recorded? I played a little boss monster. A lot more Harry Potter. Nothing but Harry Potter. No, um, so 5th edition, Boss Monster, uh, Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, and then I'm still painting, I, I'm just excited to, I, I made, uh, again, I made the mistake of buying every expansion for Star Wars Legion, so I want to get everything painted and start getting into the, the shops to play around and... Right, that's our role recap for this episode, I think. Mm hmm Um, did a lot of stuff, and... Always more gaming to be had. Um, speaking of uh, upcoming, um, the Gold Squadron Classic is this weekend, so we will I will be going out and playing uh, X-Wing 2.0 there. As... And unfortunately, I'm probably going to start buying into Star Wars X-Wing 2.0. You say that like it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing for your wallet. my wallet, yeah. And possibly your girlfriend if she finds out how much it actually cost you. Hopefully she doesn't listen to this. Maybe, maybe not. We'll find out. Um, the other piece of upcoming or recent news, yeah, X-Wing 2.0 came out uh, last week, so get your conversion kits, get your uh, list build. The app came out. It's a hit or miss. Um, there's some third-party apps out there already that seem to be doing a little bit cleaner job. I think it's just going to be a matter of time before they brush out the kinks. They haven't done this before. The other piece that um, kind of dropped today kind of knew about it in general and if you're listening and you're interested um the arkham knights uh event was officially kind of like broadcasted recently saying uh, october 19th and 20th up in roseville minnesota at the fantasy flight center they're doing their two days of everything arkham uh including showing off the third edition of the game of uh, uh, third edition of the board game that is um as well as the second part of their special event scenarios the we played the first one mm -hmm. at gen con this yeah. is the follow-up and kind of sequel storyline to it both of them will officially be released in a single pack later on but if you want to influence the game and the method of what's going on the gen con events are influencing arkham knights and arkham knights will eventually influence a future weakness card that's going to be put into the game so i'm really excited to go myself this is like my sixth year going now so if you're there, awesome. I'll see you. If not, and this isn't your thing, you know, like I've always said on the other episodes in this one too, do what 
do what you like. If mm. if you like it, do it. If you don't, don't don't uh, don't take a dump in other people's stuff. Fair enough. Um, so that is a little bit of news that I'm I'm ex- personally excited about. Um, there's so much other news and things that I can't even keep up with sometimes. Anything on your news radar that you want to bring out? Nothing too exciting on my end. Just more things for me to spend money on. Uh, I believe Boba Fett is up for pre-order. Um, either through uh, Fantasy Flight or if you go to your uh, friendly local game shop. Yeah, just a lot of... They have a lot coming out end of this quarter. So, yeah. and we've already talked about that, so it doesn't even... We don't have to go too far into it, but that's on the radar. Um, yeah, yeah. So, why don't we start diving right into our big main topic discussion today. Uh, we've talked about it on the past couple uh, episodes that we wanted to go into jargons, terminology, things of that nature, because we're talking about a hobby, and that hobby has its own little lexicon and language. And you'll get this in every hobby I've ever seen, whether you're in tabletop gaming, RPGs, crafting, working on cars, your pretty much any kind of thing that you can jump into everyone who is deeply enthralled with it have their own lingo special language for what they enjoy and i know a hundred percent of all of these but i'm just testing justin right now for all of your uh benefit okay right we'll see how this goes yeah um so we developed a list of of uh, terms that we've heard of and commonalities and try to break it down. We're going to try to go from the, the basic level to the higher level stuff too. Um, so whether you're brand new to the hobby and you're just hearing these things for the first time, welcome. Bring it on in um, and we'll try to get you up to speed. If you're established and you know most of these, thanks for taking it around. And maybe there might be a, a little aspect or something that you pick up. This is by no means a perfect list. This is by no means... 100% of the terms. It's just, you know, we can only fit so much and I can only think of so many. And we're going to give you fair warning. We're doing our best here. There are some uh, words that are of German descent and neither of us are natural German speakers. We we went through this list, well, mostly, I, you know, I'm still testing Justin. I had him come up with this list and uh right right so um i compiled the list it's in a categoric style format um where i tried to group them into similar pieces um which are uh board game components um board game genres board game mechanics and then i kind of made the last one the catch all you know other miscellaneous pile Mm. Um, because there's a lot of things that I just like, I can might get two or three in a category, but I'm like, these are the three big ones and then everything else will kind of be wrapped up at the end. Mm-hmm. To to load it off, we're going to do it with uh, components. Kind of your base, this is what a game, what game pieces are mm-hmm. um, and some of the terminologies that go with them. Uh, the very big one that most gamers will hear at some point is meeple. Yeah, that's short for meet people. Close. My people is actually how it started. What I say? Uh, meet people. I don't remember saying that. Yeah, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but uh, the game Carcassonne is the one that kind of is where this kind of spawned out of um, in the early 2000s. Te- is so far from what I've researched, the, the term is credited to Allison Hansel, where she had fused the word my and people to describe the wooden figures that you use in the game. Um, and it became meeples. Um, it has so far become a very common term, any sort of wooden figurine that looks like a little like stick figure-ish thing. Kind of like a silhouette of a person. That's a meeple. Um, you might also hear pieces called pawns. Um, this kind of comes out of chess, where, you know, or so sort of like Clue, Sorry, a lot of those roll and move sort of games mm. um, from our childhoods. Those just use pawns. Um, you'll see tokens. So these are usually your cardboard pieces, tokens, chits. But those will be like um, your pieces that you put on the board or markers or things of that nature. Um, A lot of American style games use a lot of cardboard and a lot of cards. Where the European style games will be more wooden. 
there's still your your bits and your chits is kind of where those come from dice or singular die i know that one you know that one okay because you really need it in D. &D. yeah um now as far as the rolling thingy as far as D D and the rpgs go You'll see a lot of die coding, uh, the war, um, war gaming, like the Warhammer world and the, the miniature tabletop battles are going to have this terminology too. They'll put um, a D6 or a D20. It's a 20-sided die for a D20 or a six-sided die for D6. Um, you'll see that common now uh, throughout with a lot of different terminologies. So if you do see a D number, that's usually just referring that a, a die of that many sides. There's also percentage dice. Uh, typically, you'll see two separate dice. Um, one that's usually 0 to 9, and then the other um, double 0 to 90. Uh, and then it's just you roll them together, and it gives you a number 1 through 100. Right. So kind of going off of that, you'll also see occasionally they'll be coded in such a way like 2d6 or... Again, mm -hmm. it's the number of that many-sided dice that you're rolling. Another board game component that you're going to see is modular boards. Settlers of Catan is probably the biggest and at least easiest example and most mainstream example of this, where you're going to have a series of tiles that you lay out to create your game board instead of just unfolding this cardboard thing like Monopoly or, or anything like that. You have mm -hmm. this tiles and you create your game board out of those tiles and each game can shift how those tiles are laid giving a, you a slightly different experience each yeah, time. Yeah, a lot more randomization so it's a game that you can keep on playing and chances are never play the same game twice. You know, I think I've already used this term a few times and I do apologize for it. Miniature. Mini. It's usually a little... It's the bane of my existence right now. Well, yeah, because you're playing Legion. That's yeah, why. Any kind of pewter, resin, plastic, PVC, any kind of tiny figure. I mean, we say tiny figure, but we like we talked about in one of the Gen Con episodes, we had the Big Mini, the uh, Super Star Destroyer, that was like a foot and a half long. Right. So it's anything scaled way down for use on a tabletop game. And then they usually have a level of detail to them. Mm. Um, and the games like the like Warhammer or Age of Sigmar are going to have it come gray and the intention is for you to paint it. And there's a lot of people out there very talented, way, way more talented than myself, who do amazing paint jobs on these things. Um, to you listening, he's talking about me. So you're welcome, Justin. No. Um... And then another RPG component, typically, I find, is dice towers or dice trays. Uh, a dice tower is just a mechanism. It look a wooden tower, typically, sometimes acrylic, um, that you drop the die at the bottom. It bounces around on the inside, then rolls out at the bottom to, to fairly roll your die. A dice tray would be a small box that has nice little walls for your dice so that your die, when you roll it, doesn't go flying off the table onto the floor and lost. Um, it happens. Many, uh, I dropped a couple lonely dice out there in the world that have never been found. I dropped a couple, um, when we played D&D. &D. Yeah. And then, uh, I usually exclaimed that, uh, it was gone forever and I would never see it again. Um, so that kind of picks up our components, um, piece of the puzzle. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> piece. Yes. Um, so why don't we go into genres? Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be probably one of our heavier terminology sections because there's a lot of games. And as I kind of described in our very first episode, we're in like this kind of golden age where there's all sorts of types of games and board games for different players, board games for different types of people. And there isn't necessarily this one size fits all game anymore where, boom, this is what we're busting out because that's literally all we own. It's this, or we go back to playing Monopoly. And you remember last time, we're not talking about that anymore. So in no particular order, with Euro games. These can be also considered Euro trash. You know, like those guys at the club, wearing all white, after Labor Day. Right. <laughs> like that. So a Euro game is typically a competitive game. Um, the other big feature is the players are usually not having direct interaction with each other. 
Um, I'm not trying to necessarily destroy your pieces or break your gameplay. Um, we're each trying to do the best possible to earn points, and the most points usually win. So that's that's the idea behind a Euro game is you're trying you're competing for points, and you're all trying to do the same things, but you're just trying to do it better than the other players without actually necessarily screwing your neighbor over sort of gameplay. A big long um, games tend to be called 4x games like number 4x and the x is broken up into explore expand exploit and exterminate the game's going to feature all of these elements uh, typically you're going to have a faction board or a player mat um, twilight imperium is a very popular example of a 4x game eclipse is also in this category the idea is you're finding new resources you're expanding your control of whatever you're trying to do you're exploiting those resources to gather up and do things, uh, whether you're building more stuff for yourself or you're doing something to other players. And extermination falls into the category you are literally trying to take each other out of this game. Sometimes it's like a border war where I'm going to try to take a, you know some piece of your land, you're going to try to take a piece of my land. And sometimes it's last player standing. Typically there's a, a natural game point end where there's only X amount of turns or X amount of, like in Twilight Imperium, there's X amount of victory points. So kind of like also the age-old game of Risk. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call Risk. Only because you really don't gather and use resources. Right. It's the only reason I couldn't it's see like... it. But I know if you get more area, then you get more troops. So I can see it fitting in there right that and that's why it's not necessarily a 4x game but it has elements of a 4x okay. game um i will definitely i will concede to that point that there's definitely some of these elements fit into risk but risk doesn't have all of them square square rectangle sort of argument here mm -hmm. not all rectangles are square but all squares are rectangles i was asking for a friend that wasn't uh -huh. i knew that uh-huh um abstract games are, are another category of games. They usually have no theme, and they're very, very generic. The pieces are just essentially a, uh, a thing. Most abstract games are going to be two players, and there's no randomness. Chess is going to be your very cornerstone of an abstract game. I've been playing Tack, which is another abstract game. It's a beautiful game. Uh, Go, uh, Patchwork, Azul, uh, Sangrata are all sort of these abstract games where you're trying to do these things. Dexterity-based games. Uh, I think that's a, its own little genre. Um, Jenga is probably a great example that most people are aware of. So those are kind of your dexterity-based games. You're using your fingers. Uh, Flick em Up is another dexterity-based game. You're, so you're you're doing a physical action. Drinking games. Most drinking games would be considered a dexterity-based. Yeah. Whippy cup. Yeah. Ping or uh, beer pong. Yep. Another category that has been thrown out there is. Uh, filler games, they're quick, simple, something to play to fill up time is the idea. Doesn't necessarily mean they're bad games, they're just quick and easy to learn. You can literally teach the game in less than five minutes, there's no rules download, and you're going, and then all of a sudden the game's over, and you're like, okay, that was great. Uh, what else are we doing? I use these a lot for like hosting people for board game nights. As people show up, you start throwing out the filler games, until like oh we're waiting on so and so to show up but he's going to be another 30 minutes let's bust this out and play something in the meantime Suro is one of my favorite filler games Suro's a ton of fun uh the five minute marvel and five minute dungeon are also really great filler games because they literally take five minutes or less mm -hmm. um, lanterns. lanterns lanterns would be a nice light mm -hmm. uh filler game space team is another really fun uh filler game so there's a lot in this category that you can actually just have a lot of fun with you could have a game night that is just a ton of these filler games and you're just moved from game to game to game to game to game. Opposed to saying, okay, we're going to play this for the next three hours. This is a, also a great game to get people into gaming because it's something that's easy. It's something that uh, you're probably going to tell me no. No, I'm not. If, okay. If you look, the next thing on our list is... Gateway games. Oh, fair enough. Filler games kind of fall into this category a little bit. Yeah. But um, things like Splendor, King of Tokyo, Lords of Waterdeep, uh, Seven Wonders. These are all typically considered gateway style games. Harry Potter. 
Mm. Uh, Battle for Hogwarts is a gateway game, was in my mind. They are your good, solid game that is great for someone who doesn't, who's not in the hobby yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets them to cut their teeth, and depending on which gateway game, gives them a little bit of taste of one of the other genres. So, Lords of Waterdeep, for example, can also be classified as a worker placement game, which we'll talk about later. But it's one of the lighter worker placement games, so that it's easy to learn. You can get up and going on it pretty quickly without having someone's eyes glaze over. Harry Potter's the same way. Uh, game one, two, three, literally teach you how to play a deck building game without overloading you with rules. Gateway games are are really what I would say is what you want to get into. A lot of the filler games are going to fall into this a little bit because of how easy they are to learn and how fast they are. Yeah, I keep Harry Potter in my trunk at all times. One, because my girlfriend wants to play all the time. I was going to say because you need to keep him from he should not should be named. And um, I'm pretty sure keeping a child locked in your trunk is illegal. Fair enough. But they but... did keep him in a closet under the stairs, so maybe it's an improvement. <laughs> uh, he knows some magic. Uh, but I keep it in my trunk. I keep uh, Battle for Hogwarts in my trunk. Because we do go, uh, like, uh, me and my girlfriend have actually gone out to dinner twice in the past two weeks. And it's something where we sit down and we just go, hey, do you like Harry Potter? Yeah? Okay, let me go grab this real quick. And then I throw it out and by the end of the night, they're begging us to come back for a full, like, Sunday of just playing Harry Potter all day. So you almost are treating this like this kind of like a drug deal like hey kid you want a sample yeah exactly here's the thing my girlfriend's now playing harry potter next thing i know she's gonna be like bloodshot eyes scratch her neck begging me to play some twilight imperium so i'm hoping that this is the real gateway to get her to the harder stuff because yeah no if she ever comes scratching and looking for twilight imperium i want you to send me a picture of that because i really need to see that my wife won't even like I the one day we had a big Twilight Imperium game, she came in like after setup was done, looked at the table, looked at me, shook her head and left. And it's like, yeah, no, I, I understand. There's a lot to be had there. Yeah. It, and she's living with me doing this for years, so good luck. The time frame is lost on my girlfriend. She doesn't understand why a game should go on for Eight plus hours. <laughs> For more than an hour, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, also, quick, fun games. We're, we're, on a th- we're on a roll here. Party games. These are usually high player count games. So, they'll break you up into two teams of X amount of players. And X is like this, whatever you have. You have 20 people. All right, it's two teams of 10. And there's a lot of games that fall into this category. You know, um... Captain Sonar can go up to eight players. They It can kind of be called a party game because of the high player count. You're going to have games like Taboo, uh, Cards Against Humanity, and, uh, Apples to Apples, Telestrations, Pictionary. These are all sorts of group-based games. And that's one of the biggest things about party games is they're for large groups. And you don't necessarily need to be hard on a board game enthusiast to be able to enjoy such a game. Over the years, Werewolf has become very popular at parties because of that. It's a, it, I put that in a different category, but it's also a party game. Um, one of the things you're going to see, games can be in multiple categories. Sorry, it's just what it is. It's a party game, and it's a co-op game at the same time. Every time I think of party game, I think of uh, Dignity. Dignity? I drew Dignity! No? Simpsons? I... Right over your head. Wow. That's a Simpsons reference I didn't catch. I'm I'm going to go. You should be disappointed. I am disappointed in myself. Yeah, no, I missed that one. I'm sorry. Dang. Well, I guess I'm going to have to binge all X amount, uh, 300 mum rum mumble mumble more episodes. Everything before 300, you're fine. Pretty much. We're getting to politics here. Simpsons politics. <laughs> Simpsons politics. So let's get back to board games. <laughs> right. No, you and I agree with Simpsons politics. It's okay. 
our listeners may not, but you and I have. Oh, yeah, but they're wrong if they disagree with that. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of games that are right or wrong, this is another polarizing genre. I know people who love and will only really play this genre of game, and I know people who will never play this genre of game co op games. There's another mechanic that we'll actually, or terminology that we'll talk about a little bit later that it. I'll bring back co-op into it um, a little bit because that's really where it turns up. But co-op games, uh, games like Pandemic Legacy, is considered a co-op game. Uh, Arkham Horror, uh, both the card game and board game, are co-ops. Not Um, that I haven't already brought it up four separate times, but Harry Potter (laughs) is a co-op game. So the idea behind these co-op games is you're all working together to beat the game. There's either a bad guy in the game or some goal that you're trying to accomplish together as a team to do this. You're not out to one-up each other, necessarily. Um, I have seen some co-op games that will add a little bit of a competitive point scoring in it. Uh, Gen 7 does this. It's a co-op game. But if you score more points, you look better in the corporation on the ship, so guess who gets the promotion? The You're guy the winner who, of the winners. You're the winner of the winners. Um, or as uh, one of our friends' uh, wives has denoted, you win-win the game at that point. But those are your co-op games, and there are people who love them and people who hate them, and I understand that. I'm one of the ones who loves them. I find it very easy for people to jump in and pick up a game and not necessarily be a, uh, a deep enthusiast, but wants to sit in on someone like their boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or spouse or wife or, you know, whatever, and be able to try to enjoy what they enjoy while not necessarily being as enthusiastic about it. Uh, there's also legacy games. This is kind of a new genre that's come up over the past couple of years. Uh, started out with Risk Legacy. Uh, Pandemic has two Season 1 and Season 2 Legacy there's Seafall, Charterstone um, is a legacy game. There is Werewolf Legacy, which I got to learn about at um, the Alliance Open House, which is really interesting. Um, and finally, there's also Betrayal at House on the Hill Legacy coming out this year. Hmm. I learned about this at the Alliance Open House, got a little bit more details about it. You play over time the history of the hill. Oh. Of the house on the hill, so it's. I'm really excited to see how this goes because essentially you go from the way past and you jump decades and, and centuries, and the last game takes place when House on the Hill came out, so it leads you right up into the events of what we've been playing for the past decade or so of this game. If you play that without me, you will become. It's okay. You'll be part of the it. If it's anything like the original game, we need at least three players. No, so, yeah, that game's amazing. So we yeah, need we no. need people. If you're in it, you're in it for the entire game because that's how entire, I like yeah. to run for uh, legacy games here. Um, so those are kind of your um, legacy style games. Um, a big heavy one called Gloomhaven is also legacy. The idea behind these games is you're making permanent changes to the game. Every game pops open the same. Your entire setup, game one, is going to be identical for pretty much every single person. But at the end of each game, you make choices that affect the next game, which affect the next game, which affect the next game. This could be writing on the board. This could be ripping up cards. This could be a plot twist where typically there's like boxes to open where like, oh, you've launched three nukes in one turn. Open this box when that happens and something will ha- It literally pauses the game. You open up the box has instructions on what to do. They are a unique game in the sense of there's nothing else really like that. The first time through it is kind of the only time through it. They've evolved a little bit. Uh, Games like Charterstone, you start with like a blank slate and then you kind of build a worker placement game out of it. At the end of your, your, your legacy campaign, you can keep playing that game, but it's something you custom crafted to to your taste. Risk Legacy is the very same way. You play 15 games, the board is a complete mess by the end of it, but you can keep playing games of Risk on it. Um, Pandemic Legacy and really doesn't do that. There's kind of a story arc, once you're done, you're done. But the way they run that game, you get 12 to 24 
games out of it, depending how well you do. So for the price tag, you're still getting hours and hours and hours of fun out of these things. So a lot of people gripe about, well, once I'm done, I'm done. Sure, that might be true. But if you rent a movie, you spent how much on that movie and only got two hours of entertainment out of it? Well, not to mention also, if you think about it, if I buy a game that's not a legacy game, I can play it a few times. I might not play it at all. But if I buy a legacy game, we're going to guaranteed to play that, like, Pandemic 12 to 24 times. Right. You you incentivize yourself to go back and keep playing. So that's our legacy game uh, genre. Another genre that I've come across is asymmetrical games. A um, little bit of a subgenre. Players do not have the same goals. And uh, Vast is a very good example. Everyone's playing a different thing. They're playing the game very differently from anybody else. They're some of the hardest games to teach because... In order to teach a game like that, I have to teach every single role. And forbid that the next time I bust it out, someone hasn't played that role before. Or, like, it's always kind of a learning thing unless you get the group that keeps playing it. Asymmetrical games, everyone's kind of doing their own thing, and they're playing it differently. Uh, Star Wars Rebellion is another really good example of this. The Rebels play very differently than the Empire. It's an asymmetrical game. They're, they're, you're not doing the same thing as the other player. Ameritrash... There's a lot of story elements to them. They're flashy. There's colorful components. They usually have a intellectual property behind it. So a lot like the Arkham Horror games are considered uh, a mere trash. Your Star Wars games are going to be in this category. There's a lot in this category. But if you've heard the term a mere trash, that's kind of what they're talking about. It's a very heavily thematic game um, that usually players are against each other at some point too, unless it's a co-op. That's the kind. That's kind of the idea behind a mirror trash game. Is you're you're at least playing the same field and you're going after each other in some capacity, and it's a very heavy thing. Why don't you take the next one? So next, uh, we're gonna go into um, some of the different kinds of card games. CCG. Any of you Pokemon fans out there might remember this as uh, the TCG. Either collectible card game, either collectible card game. Or trading card games. Most popular examples being like Magic the Gathering, again, Pokemon. Um, there's Yu Gi Oh! Yu Gi Oh! Star Wars Destiny. It's pretty much, uh, and, and sometimes it's even, like you said, with Ameritrash, it, it can be something based off of a intellectual property. There's actually a Simpsons trading card game out there. Uh, I mean, it hasn't been. Jiminy Jokers! <laughs> It hasn't been out in quite a while, but these are games where you go and you buy packs and packs and packs and packs of cards, or you spend money for the cards that you just can't find in the packs. All completely randomized. You build decks out of it, typically 40 to 60 cards per deck. Lots of tournament-based events. Lots of trying to fine-tune your deck so that you can compete with other people. Right. So head v head is usually the most common uh, CCG uh, format where I'm playing against you, you're playing against me. Keyforge is going to be that style, but uh, they kind of had their own category on that one. So well, I kind of tossed that one at the end because Fantasy Flight decided to literally name a new genre for us. So we'll talk about that. Another type of uh, card game, living card game. Uh, similar concept, but instead of just having packs with randomized cards you instead have um, packs which will guarantee you a set of cards so kind of like the trading card game pre-built decks where you know if you buy a magic the gathering or pokemon deck it's gonna come with xyz uh lcgs are going to have that for every pack you buy a pack it says hey you get xyz whether it's a full core set or just a supplement set fantasy flight was the one that kind of developed this uh format um they use it most of their main card games right now fantasy flight and they're creating all kinds of new card games because they have uh key forge they have the lcgs and then even their star wars destiny where it's it's technically a ccg 
but with dice. Because yeah. it just needs to be an extra level of complicated. And also, now, when you want to play a certain card, you need two dice, which means you have to two, or you have to find two of those very hard-to-find cards. Yep. It prints money. Deduction games are another genre that we can talk about. Um, this is usually either a social deduction game or just a standard deduction game. We talked about Cryptid in the beginning. That was, I, we kind of described it as a deduction game. Battlestar Galactica, Resistance, Werewolf, uh, even Dead of Winter sometimes will have these hidden traitor mechanic attached to it, um, which we'll talk about a little bit. Super simplified, Resistance, Secret Hitler, anything right. like that. Social deduction. There's two teams. One, uh, Hail Hydra is another example. Mm. There are t- usually, everybody has uh, identity cards usually saying, you are not a werewolf. Or you are not Hydra. Or you are not this. But there's going to be a few players that say, you are this. And the players who are that secret team know each other, typically. Um, There's variants on that. But typically they know each other. And they're trying to break the game and and essentially force the group to lose the game while the rest of the group is trying to figure out who they are so they can stop them to win the game. So there's a lot of actual social interaction on those for the most part. That's the social side of it. Uh, the other type of deduction games are going to be like code names, where I'm trying to make you and the rest of my team guess the specific cards while there's another player trying to do that with their teams. So you're trying to kind of like put these clues together to figure out the answer. There is a micro game genre that's out there. Love Letter is a very big one of these. I like to call them your pocket games or your backpack games. They're small, they're fast, they're light. You don't have to carry around a big box with a bunch of pieces. There's usually a deck of cards, maybe some tokens, and that's it. They're they're quick, simple micro games. Uh, Solo games. Uh, Solo games are another big one that have been coming a little bit more popular where um, either you... The game itself either has a solo mode where you can play it by yourself and then there's like an AI mechanic where another player is kind of faked in through um, whether a deck of cards or a predetermined set of rules that the AI has to follow. Um, Or there's games that are purely meant for one player to play. Van Ryder makes a game called Hostage Negotiator, where it's just you, a deck of cards, and you're you're, you're playing the role of a hostage negotiator trying to talk this guy off the ledge before he kills all his hostages. Or she, depending on which uh, uh, terrorist or, or threat that you have there. But the idea is I can play that by myself. I don't need anybody else. And... Sometimes if you're traveling, they're great games. Um, I have took a couple on vacation where my wife and I do play some games, but I brought some solo games so that I can, like, she can do whatever she wants, go sit, you know, sit on the beach and where it's hot, sunny, and sandy, where I can go, I'm just going to sit at the bar and play this little micro game, tile laying games. I haven't talked about those yet. I've talked about a couple games and used them for examples in other genres, uh, Carcassonne. I brought up when I talked about Meeple. Um, it's a tile laying game. You have a set of tiles. You're playing those out as the game progresses. Twilight Creations has a game called Zombies with like three explanation points. Um, those are your tile laying games. Suro. Suro is a tile layer too. And th- that's the idea. You're laying tiles down to build out the board or build out a mechanic. Um, I think that covers it for our genres. Next piece that I want to touch on is game mechanics. We've talked about a little bit of them, and, and I knew this was going to happen as we went through this discussion. These things are going to bleed over a little bit. We'll start with worker placement. You have a control set of people, uh, usually meeples, and you're placing them out on the board and getting something done for them. I place this figure out, I get this item or resource. You place a figure out and item or resource. One of the major components is you usually only have a couple, and these locations that you're putting them out on the board... They're usually limited, saying you can only put one, maybe two people out there or, or tokens out there to claim that resource. So once I take that spot, you may not have that spot available to you. There's a little bit of trying to manipulate and screwing each other over and like, I'm going to take this spot before you do. But there's 
the nice thing about this mechanic, there's always usually something else that will still benefit you. It just may not be what you wanted to do in that action. Area control games, where if you control most of the board, you're going to win. Risk is like the prime example of what area control used to be. Uh, games like Blood Rage have kind of evolved that. But the you're trying to put dudes on a map, and the more dudes you have on said map, the more likely it is you're going to win. Another example would be Ticket to Ride, whereas instead of you know, war game, uh, area control, instead you're trying to control the different routes on the map. Once you throw down your train cars, no one else can claim the, that, that track. Right. So I'm going to let you take the next term too, because you've been talking about this type of uh, mechanic all night already. I've been talking about it for the past three episodes. What we're going to be talking about right now is deck building. Um, games where you obtain cards uh, to put in your own deck. The one example that you all are probably sick of hearing right now is Harry Potter uh, Hogwarts Battle. You you start off with a 10-card deck. With that deck, you gain resources to buy more cards to put in your discard pile. Once you get through your deck, reshuffle, start playing it again. Keep doing that until you build a large deck full of all kinds of nasty little uh, surprises. This can be cooperative games, this can be competitive games, but the basic idea of the game is just you're pulling stuff, you're throwing it in your deck, and you're doing that turn after turn after turn until you have a full-fledged deck in front of you. Action selection games. Action selection mechanics. Every turn you get to do something do you want to move your piece do you want to put a new piece down do you want to draw a card discard a card like play a card those are your action selection there's usually you have a bunch of different options on a turn and a lot of them like a pandemic for example you get four actions per turn what they are what order you do them in can vary but that's your action selection mechanic is it's your turn what do you want to do and you actually have choices, not just the old roll and move. Bluffing, this is usually in your social uh, deduction games like Werewolf and Secret Hitler, um, Sheriff of Nottingham, Resistance. I am literally trying to lie to you about something in this game. I have something to admit to our listeners. Uh, when I said earlier that I knew all these terms, that was bluffing. So if you fell for it, shame on you. Yeah, I guess. Nah. I, don't know. I wouldn't shame them. That's okay, though. Hidden Traitor. Another mechanic similar to Bluffing. This is where you have like a secret team. Dead of Winter. Everyone's handed out these little roll cards, and you'll flip it over as your secret objective, and one of them might actually say you're a traitor. You're working against the rest of the group. Even though it's kind of a co-op game, there could be that one to two players that are working against the main group, and their goals are usually not only counter to the group, but they have to stay hidden during this time because otherwise the entire group has a me usually a mechanic that says we're going to vote you off the island or out of the colony or uh, we're going to airlock you in the sense of Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, if, if you're found out and you're the traitor, bad stuff can happen to you. Um, so you kind of are playing like a little bluffing mini game within the game, but I felt it was a, a unique enough mechanic to kind of warrant its own little sidebar here. Um, auction bidding mechanics are out there where um, you're literally taking your resources usually it's money or some sort of tokens and I want to buy this card so I'm gonna buy it for two money but then you have the option to say three money or, or whatever and we kind of keep bidding on on our actions or our, our mechanics one of the rarely used rules of Monopoly if you don't buy a property it goes up to auction not many people remember that yeah, that's why people don't like me. Uh, hidden information uh, is a mechanic that usually you will have something secret that you're trying to keep from everybody else, and they're trying to find that out. Um, a lot of American-style games and thematic games have hidden information, where the Euro style tend not to. Everything is kind of known in a Euro game for the most part. The, the, the board state, the cards available, the actions available to everybody is like, out there in front of everybody but hidden information is usually i have a hand of cards that you don't know what i can do with or i have a secret objective that i'm trying to do 
those are the sorts of things that hit information. You don't, you can't play a perfect game because there's a random, not, not a random element, but there's an element of information that you do not possess that you either need to figure out or have to play around. Would something like the destination cards or um, the cards from Ticket to Ride, the ones that you keep to yourself and you have to... Yes. Okay, so those would be... That would be your hidden, hidden information. information. Okay. Um, because I don't know what route you have. Now, on the, I can look at the board and say, well, you built from Chicago to L.A. you got to have something good there. But I don't know for sure. Because that's that's hidden information from me. You know it. I don't know it. That's kind of the, the mechanic there. Um, roll and move. Um, usually this is your older design games. Um, sorry, Monopoly. You pick up a die. You roll it. That's how many spaces you get to move. Something happens. It's a pretty archaic form of gameplay now. I don't see it around anymore. You know, I was just thinking, I'm looking at all of your games right now, and it would be hard for me to actually pick out one. Um, it's, a, it's a mechanic that developers, as they learned, it's not a really good mechanic. And that's my personal opinion, and, and the, the industry has kind of shuffled away from it because of that. Um, there might be roll and acquire, like Catan, you roll dice. And mm-hmm. that number pops up, and those tiles are the ones that activate. Which, but you're not moving. It's not like this random like I'm going to move one to six spaces this turn. What is it going to be? One. What am I going to roll next turn? One. What am I rolling next turn? Ooh, two. I've moved four spaces in three turns. Like, it takes a lot of fun out. Don't of it. collect go or do not pass go. Do not collect four hundred or, or boy, yeah. Do not collect two hundred hours. Yes. Thank you. Um. But, like, Monopoly is a great example of how this can just burn someone off of this mechanic because those three set properties, let's say you have Monopoly, I roll, I land on the first one, my next turn, I roll on the next one, and then I land on the third one on my third turn, I'm bankrupt, and, well, our friendship is over. because Chances you... are, if we're playing Monopoly, our friendship was well over before <laughs> I had a Monopoly. It's probably true. I am not very nice at that game. Um, drafting mechanics. I've seen this pop up in a bunch of different games now, too. I actually am a big fan of drafting. It's a lot like your sports, where you're going to have a hand of cards or a hand of something, and I'm going to select one of those things that I want for myself. And then I'm going to pass it along to the next player. And then the player on the other side of me passes what they were picking out of, and we keep picking and kind of building our what we think is our winning hand or team. Um, Seven Wonders is a great card drafting game that's out there that uses a mechanic very heavily. There was that Van Ryder. Uh, The Big Score. Big Score, there you go. Big Score also does a big drafting mechanic early on in the first phase of the game because you're drafting your perfect heist team Mm -hmm. to do the jobs that you think you're going to do. Pick Up and Deliver uh, is a mechanic where your piece is literally going to pick up resources at one location on the board and then you're going to move that to another location and drop it off. Um, I grew up on Empire Builder, which is a very, very, very heavy pick-up and deliver game. That is the core of that game. The Firefly board game is like that. Wasteland Delivery Service is like that. You're, you're just... Every time you make these deliveries, you're getting points or money to do it better the next time around, and essentially that's the whole point of the game, and that's the mechanic behind it. Rondel, we talked about a little bit on one of the genres, but the mechanic is essentially where the players are moving usually a piece or group of pieces around a circular board or circular object, and what it lands on tells you what actions you can take. Uh, Stefan Feld does a lot of games like that. Um, It's a pretty heavy, I've seen it a lot in Euro design games, and I've seen a couple American style games that are starting to incorporate this too. Um, AEG Scorpius Freighter is going to be using a mechanic like this. But it's your global shared resource that keeps moving around in a a cycle or a circle. And where that piece lands tells you what you get to do on that turn. Route building. This is is actually a little bit more where Ticket to Ride train games kind of fall into. You're you're claiming these routes, you're claiming these routes. And once it's claimed, it's done. You you don't get to modify it. uh, the 18xx games, uh, Power Grid, Brass, those are other examples that kind of use this. Ticket to Ride is the big one, though, that uses that mechanic. 
Okay. So that's game mechanics. And I know there's a lot more out there that I missed, but I tried to hit the big ones. Other terms that have come up in board gaming, noob, newbie, new player. People can say it in a very derogatory way, like, ugh, freaking noobs. And I'm not like that. I don't like that terminology that way. But if you hear it, if you're newbie or noob, it just means, for the most part, you're new to the hobby or genre or whatever. And, you know, honestly, I've been in... I've been gaming for close to 10 years now, and I would even consider myself a newbie because there's a lot of games I haven't played. I may be used to certain styles of games or certain types of games, but if I sit down and play, for instance, chances are, I'd say half the time I play a game with you, I'm going to be a complete newbie to the game. You just have, again, I'm sitting here with a couple hundred games around me. I've probably maybe played like 20 of the games in here it's bound to happen everybody's a noob or newbie at some point and even i have not played certain genres of games and i would call myself a noob at them Mm. i don't think it's a bad term it's just a term that has come up going back to your co-op games or your slightly points based competitive games um, one of the terms that comes up and you'll hear it sometimes is kingmaker or king making It's an action where a losing player has the opportunity to decide who wins the game. So if I'm losing and it's you or someone else, I would be considered a kingmaker. I literally can decide who wins the game and it's out of both of your controls. It's a really... I don't like it when it pops up because as a player, I should be able to control my own winning and losing. As far as that goes, I don't think another player's choice direct choice at least should impact my winning or losing of a game um games uh, a lot of competitive games come up with it um so that's king making usually that is not a good thing to hear in a game but it does pop up that can even be referred to as someone like let's say me and someone else were playing risk mm-hmm. and i'm about to lose so i can decide to take my team or take my turn to screw someone over to give someone else an advantage. Right. Though those 4X games are very, very... King-making can happen. And in some of the more modern ones try to curve it where it can't happen as often. But it does happen. It just It's a natural thing of those very competitive fast, mm-hmm. uh, aspect games. You'll see uh, print-and-play be referenced a lot. Uh, print-and-play is usually where a uh, board game designer will put it out often usually for free the files where you can take it to kinko's or staples or even your home printer and print out paper copies of this game i have seen these quite a bit on uh, kickstarter if someone's trying to get you interested in a usually from what i've seen like a card game Mm -hmm. they'll provide a test print and play set so that you can kind of get a feel for it before deciding to throw down the money on Yeah, a way to kind of try before you buy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's actually a really nice thing. Um, I've done a couple print-to-play games myself just to kind of see um, what they're like, and I've purchased a game based off of that. So it's I, I think it's a good thing. Um, not all games do it, and certainly not games will all do it, but especially for like the Kickstarter group, it's a really good way of getting people enticed into it. There is a term out there, I I couldn't really call it mechanic, called points salad. I don't think you've ever even heard of that before today. Um, News to me. News to you. Point salad is a a term kind of tossed towards games that have a bajillion different ways to score. Ticket to Ride is not a point salad. When you say this, I'm thinking more of big score um, from Van Ryder games, only because they give you... A bunch of different items that are worth different values. So you have a bunch of different ways you can gain those points. Right. Here's the best way to identify if you have a point salad game. Did it come with a score pad that you have to take the time to calculate your score at the end of the game? That is usually a point salad game. Games like uh, Agricola or Feast of Odin will have those seven wonders is a point salad game because you get points for uh 
blue cards, you get points for green cards, you get points for winning wars, you get points for having money, you have points for building your one. There's mm. points coming out of everywhere. Everything you did earned you a point in some fashion. Thus, point salad. You'll hear replay value a lot. We kind of touched base on this concept and this term when we talked about the legacy games. Legacy games, a lot of people worry about the replay value. I have learned not to worry about it as much because your cost per hour per per fun factor is usually still just as good. Uh, unless you really, really, really dive into one particular game, playing it more than 20, 30, you know, 20 times in a year is a very of, of, of high goal. Replay value is how often can you replay that game without getting it stale, repetitive, old, or um, ruining it for yourself. You will see they have those um, murder mystery games where it's a very specific ending and you and X amount of friends play different characters and you're supposed to really reveal stuff. You can't really play that again because right. if you've played it once, you know this character's the one who... And that never changes. It never changes. So um, Time stories. As much as I enjoy playing it, has a very low replay value innately because those are a deck exploration style game where you, the the elements that you're going to find in that game are in the same place every time. The same cards are always the same. There's no real random element. Um, the idea behind that, though, is you may not be able to beat the game on the first go, so there's a little replay value as you try to do it better the next time because you only have X amount of turns in that game. But still, once I've played a Time Story scenario, I'm kind of done with it. That's a low replay value for me. Now, I love it in the sense of I can take this and then I can watch a bunch of other people play and just sit back and smile and put my fingers like a Mr. Burns style. Uh, the Escape Rooms. Mm -hmm. the escape Room games are a very great example of a low replay value game. Once you've played a unlocked game and have beaten it or have played most of it, it's hard to replay that. Because you go back in there, you know you exactly know everything. where everything is. Or the exit games that also try to do that escape room, in a, escape room in a box game literally have you destroying parts of the game and ripping open envelopes of things that you can't reset. So those are usually one and done games. There's no replay value. But... Are Get they, it right the first time. But they're still fun. There's just no replay value. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's what replay value really talks about is how many times can you keep playing that same game before it gets old or stale or or boring you'll see vp or vic which is short for victory points it's usually just your score but vp is usually what is short shortened down to a lot of times in board games uh, gc is another one for gold coins gc vp they're kind of just interchangeable depending on what game you're playing it's just another way to say mm -hmm. here's your gold here's your points here's your x you know whatever counter token thing that we're doing there mm -hmm. um back to our co-ops Alpha gamer or quarterbacking. I've, uh, I usually hear it called quarterbacking. It is when a dominating personality will dictate other players' turns for them to optimally play the game. They're literally trying to play the game for that person. This is what sours a lot of people on co-op games because it's very easy to bully someone who doesn't understand the game yet. Now, if it's a bunch of veteran players, this is less likely to happen. Personalities at the table can change whether this shows up or not. I try to do my best not to, to do this. I, I have done it in the past, I will admit. I never feel good about it in reflection. I, I almost always apologize to the player once I realize I did it. Because it's, it's a crummy thing to do. Because the other player that you're doing this to can literally go, why am I even playing? I can literally go away and nothing will change. Their input means nothing. So if you ever want to turn someone off on co-op games or games in general, the alpha game them, and that's how that's going to happen. Now, while usually you you absolutely don't want to do this with your friends, if you are playing at a convention or at a random party or with anyone you don't know at the table, or even if you know one person, even if there's one person you don't know at the table... Don't be that guy. True. Like, if you if someone is taking time out of their day to play this game at a convention or at a party, 
they're looking to have fun. They're not looking to have you tell them what to do. Absolutely. One of the things that I will say, if you want to run that Knife's Edge, and you have a new player in a co-op game, suggest actions. And I strongly use the word suggest. um, Because they may not understand, they may not grasp what sorts of actions they can take. So when I'm trying to teach a game, I usually go through a whole gambit. I won't say, well, this is what you should do. I'll say things of, this is what you could do. Uh, If you want, you can move over here. Uh, If you want, you can do this. If you want, you can do this. And just kind of outline their actions. That's more instructing them and teaching them the game than quarterbacking. And ultimately, if you're in this I gotta win mindset, they're new to the game. Let them learn. One of the best things we can learn from is our mistakes. So if they play a bad game of Pandemic, they're going to learn the hard way that you probably should have uh, taken care of that disease cube. They're going to gain more, exactly, they're going to gain more out of that loss instead of watching you play their turns for them. Let them let them experience the game, let them understand what they're doing right, doing wrong. And yeah, exactly, suggestions. Say, have you thought of, or you can also do certain things. And don't, don't phrase it as, well, you can't take care of that disease cube. Because that's it's a suggestion. Mm-hmm. But... They already know. They know. Let them do their thing. Right. Um, so enough about alpha gaming and, and quarterbacking. Expansions. Board games are now getting add-ons, expansions to a lot of the, a lot of the games. It's your physical DLC. Yes. Or downloadable content for those who don't play the video games. What's well, a video game? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes these expansions are going to be extra pieces... The ones I always typically enjoy are the ones that add extra players. Uh, Catan is a great example. One of the major expansions that I always suggest people to get is the five Five to six six. player expansion to allow you to play up to six players. And there might be different stories, different versions. There's a lot of ways a game can expand. Um, We're actually going to have a whole, probably a whole discussion about expansions and, and our thoughts and feelings and and. And kind of what they can do versus what different they don't types, do. Different yeah. types. And also, are they good for a game? Are they bad for a game? Is there good examples of expansions? How to expand a game? Is it bad? We'll, we'll touch all that mm-hmm. in, in a future episode. Oh, yeah. We can talk for hours on. Uh, this next one. Sorry. German. I'm trying my best. Spiel des Sals. Spiel des Sals. All right. Uh, that is uh, currently a series of... Three separate uh, awards given out annually from a uh, panel, or they call themselves a jury, of board game critics in Germany, as you can tell from the German name. Games that receive uh, this award typically display uh, the award icons on their box with the corresponding year it was award um, awarded. The three categories of awards are Game of the Year, Connoisseur Game of the Year, Typically games with a, or well they are, um, games with a high play difficulty. And then uh, Children's Game of the Year. They have a website running all the way back to 1979 um, of all of the winners, nominees, and recommended games. So if you're looking for something to that should get you uh, into the game or, or into the hobby... If you're looking for something new, I use new in air quotes because, I mean, you look at something from 1979, it's not necessarily new, but it's new to you. Um, these games typically are very robust, very good uh, games to sink your teeth into. Right. It's a very prestigious award. They only give out those three per year in those very specific categories. And like you said, it's a very good way of identifying... This is probably something I should look into. Um, it may not be your game. It may not do things you like it to do. But it's doing something good in in whatever mm. category it's doing. So it, it's definitely a way to gauge, hey, you know what? If it has one of these Spiel logos on it, you may want to just at least pick it up and look at it. Yeah, um, exactly. It may, not, exactly. it may not be, like I said, it may not be your thing, but... It's at least a, a, a mark of respect or a mark of uh, admiration. Admiration of, of like, hey, that that game did something. That was a it, solid, it, solid game. 
people voted and, and and a jury said yes this is the game of the year 2018 so that always comes up and it's always interesting to see who who takes that own that prize you uh, know with with the level of maturity that you bring to the table here i'm gonna let you take this next one uh yeah the next one's a box, box fart that's the noise the lid makes when you slide it down on the box or off the box um it should not be confused with a fiert. A fiert is a fart out of fear. Um, sometimes playing Reign of Cthulhu or anything with a lot of uh, tension tension and horror. Those tend to slip out. But yeah, no. Closing the box, opening the box, when it makes that negative air sound. There you go. Box fart. Box I'm fart. so glad we got to talk about that one. Yeah. Sleeping, card sleeving. Um, you'll see that one term kind of thrown around in once in a while. Usually those card games or deck games that have, like, the only thing is a deck of cards, like Magic, you're going to have sleeve cards in a lot of the uh, upper play tournaments and things of that. Board games are starting to get that now because if you have a high replay value, some people are very protective about their the quality and the condition of their their items so they want to sleep the cars so that they can last longer and not show that wear and tear some people you mean the people sitting at this table right now i don't sleep everything just no, i'm sleeping way. a lot now i sleep the games that i know um are gonna get either a lot of play just so that i don't have to buy another copy or i almost always will sleeve deck building games yeah um and that's mainly be specifically because you always start with that base 10 or base 20 cards and you're, you at, you're shuffling it all the time. Those are going to wear and tear probably the fastest, even if you don't play it all the time. I uh, I wasn't about that card sleeving life until I brought up your guys' favorite game by this point, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. First hand into the game, my girlfriend threw a promo card straight into the cucumber dip after promise me, promising me she was going to Take very good care of it. So now everything is sleeved. No more worries. Right. Even the cucumber dip got sleeved that night. <laughs> Conventions or cons. Uh, Gen Con, for example, in our last two episodes. Yeah, you got a lot of con talk on the last two episodes. It's usually a fair expo sort of situation where a bunch of like-minded individuals will go together and then geek out all in one giant group. And play games everywhere and everything. Shoved into hotels, uh, convention centers, banquet halls, warehouses. We don't care. Put us wherever. Inserts. Um, something that we'll <laughs> talk about in one of the um, future episodes. <laughs> yeah. So mature. I'm so glad we've uh, left saved all this for the end. Um, so... Uh, inserts are going to be usually cardboard or balsa wood. Um, we talked about how I picked up a bunch of broken token. Those are inserts. You literally take the guts out of the game and you build these things to put in it, which help organize it and will um, allow for a little bit easier pieces, storage. To optimize the space within there, make sure yeah. that if you have certain things in certain areas that you want to keep them separated... And really one of the big things a lot of people use these for are for uh, two other terms, set up, and, uh, set up and tear down. Some games with a lot of components take a lot of time to set up because you're assembling different decks of cards, you're putting pieces out, you're putting tokens out, you're putting things on the board, and then you're handing things to players. Um, these inserts are a very good way of speeding up that process uh, and that setup time. Likewise, the reverse of that idea is teardown. Once you're done with the game, there are pieces everywhere. There are cards everywhere. Um, and these inserts are a way to help organize that and quickly. Everything kind of has its own little home that the entire group can hopefully, the entire group, unless they're that person who uh, doesn't help, will be able to tear down that game very quickly and, and put it away in a nice, easy fashion. Um, you'll, uh, you'll see... There are sites, like Justin uh, mentioned, Broken Token, that make these. You can also find tons of people online who make their own customized um, foam core. 3D uh, printing. 3D printing, all kinds of different ways. So it is, I mean, you, when, when you think of people who, who really want the best for the games that they have, 
they look for things like this just to make sure everything is nice, taken care of, protected, everything yep. they can imagine. Out of print, this comes up in board games often enough where uh, Fury of Dracula is a great example of an out of print game right now. Fantasy Flight was making the third edition of it. Uh, they stopped printing it. They stopped producing the game because they lost the license to it because it went back to Games Workshop. Now, WizKids picked up that license or got the rights to print it. So right now it's out of print, but it's going to be coming back just under a different publisher. There's um, a lot of things will just kind of go in and out of style. I typically will see this with games that just kind of just don't have a shelf life anymore. No one's buying it. It had its time in the sun and now that time has faded and they kind of retire it. Um, or they lost the licensing and, or it's a, an, uh, um, an item that isn't hot anymore. Yeah. Uh, Battlestar Galactica is a, a great example of a board game that's very popular, very well known, and a lot of people love it. But it's out of print right now because the show was from 2005 it's 2018. There's fans, yes, but it's not going to be selling in such a capacity that the company wants to keep making it. No. Um, rules lawyering. Now, this one usually came out of uh, D&D terms and RPGs from me. It's your know-it-all. It's your... Well, in the rule here, it says blah, blah, blah. That's rules lawyering. In d d it's usually a little bit more of a taboo thing because... It's usually a player and not the dungeon master doing it, which the dungeon master is the one running the game and should be the the, the sole arbiter of rules. Uh, in board games, it kind of comes up to if you surprise someone with a rule that they were unaware of and they were having a good time, this could spoil that fun. Um, so again, just be very careful if you are going to try to play by the rules. Um, you're going to make mistakes. I have I played a game for an entire year playing one particular thing wrong, and it never really impacted... Well, it made the game harder for us because it was a co-op game that we were doing it wrong. But realizing and learning, like, oh, we were playing that wrong. You know, and that's where I approached the group and went, hey, guys, you know, I know we're having fun with this, but I reread this, and this is actually how we're supposed to be playing. And from that point forward, we kind of did it, but... Doing it mid-game is very rough because that could change the outcome of the game, things like that. Um, I usually have a rule, uh, like a house rule sort of situation. Um, house rules are your kind of custom rules that are not necessarily printed in a book or anything. And the idea I usually put out there is, okay, we've been playing it this way so far this game. Let's continue to do it the way we have been. And in future games, we'll, we'll uh, make that adjustment. Unless it's something that is mm. completely ridiculous that we need to correct right away. I try to do it in the most fair way possible. It's my, my two cents there. Real lawyers are the reason I no longer play Magic the Gathering. Because it's the people who dig through every single ruling just to make sure that whatever they try pulling will. And not to say everyone does it, but... Um, I'm a cat. I was a casual player, so I never played tournaments. Mm -hmm. Having someone in a casual game, a friend in a casual game, just go, no, that's not tournament rules. This is tournament rules. I can do this, meaning you can't do that. And it just turns into, okay, I think I was having fun. I think I was having fun. I'm not anymore. I'm good. Thank you. Trash talk. Can be good, can be bad, based on the game. Um, you see this in almost anything that is competitive. Usually it's banter or uh, between two players. Trash talking can get to the extreme where you're making threats, putting each other down and being very negative against each other. You, Everyone's going to play differently. So I know people who play games like Diplomacy, Risk, these heavy, very competitive games, and will literally rip each other new ones while they play. At the end of the game, all of them understand it was a game. And there's usually no hard feelings between friends at that point. I have seen those hard feelings translate over into real life, which then that's where it becomes a problem. But usually what I'll see is that translate into the next time they sit down and play that game. Remember Bob? Bob was a jerk. Let's let's team up and take down Bob because Bob was a real jerk last time. 
And that's where the trash talking really mm. kind of becomes a, a little bit more element and fun of the game. But you got to be careful with it. Mm. I recently, I went, and within the last year, started hearing the term AP tossed around. I never saw this word shortened to AP until recently, but I knew the concept. It was analysis paralysis. It is when a player starts to break down every single permutation or option they have and the consequences thereof while trying to make a choice in a game. It literally slows down the flow of the game. It comes it, it, like the entire flow comes to a screeching halt as they're trying to uh, figure out what their try what their best move is going to be. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to figure out your best move, but there's a certain point where you just become. That's why they call it paralysis. You 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 literally just freeze up and you can't make that decision. And no matter what you can do, you're just stuck with there. And you're like. Um, 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 um. It's, uh, and a lot of your decision-making should be done on other players' turns so that the game can keep that flow. Yeah. It happens. It happens. It happens. It's ha- happened to me. It's... It's happened to me. It, yeah. It's a it's a natural thing. Some people are more prone to it than others. Work it out with the group. Mm. You know, like, hey, do you need, a, you know, if, it, if it's a, a chronic thing, do you need a sand timer or something to kind of like, hey, you got to make a decision before this is out. If you're in a group of people who all get this, a game that most people can play in two hours can take twice as long. And it's going to drain on you as far as the fun factor. I, I'm, it's just going to be yeah, um, a draining thing. Another term, I usually see it shortened down to BGG, uh, Board Game Geek, which is a community website that uses uh, board card, war game information... Literally, you can kind of type up any game you ever think of that has or will or was in existence at some point. And they've got a, a catalog information then in there. How many players was it? Who made it? What made it? it it's the IMDB of board games. There is um, another major German term in board gaming. Usually, I hear it called Essen. Uh, Spieltag. International Spieltag, which is the largest gaming convention in Europe. It is a launching point for board games. There's usually hundreds and now lately thousands of board games that are literally this is where they were first sold and started um, each year and it's kind of that this is where the year starts for board gaming. Um, Gen Con is the US version of Essen as far as one of the largest conventions out there. Because board gaming is so large in Europe, Essen is huge. Speaking of huge and money, uh, Kickstarter has now been a very large crowdsourcing mechanic that board game companies as well as indie developers have been using to launch and produce their games. Retailers are kind of a hit or miss. Some people love it, some people hate it. Kickstarter is a way that some games that may never have been created... This is their avenue of getting made. Whether it's a good thing or bad thing, I'm going to say it's a personal choice. I actually believe that Kickstarter is a good thing for the industry, at least from a gamer's perspective. I 100% understand where the uh, retailer's perspective comes from, uh, being a retailer themselves of, well, if you can pre-order or kickstart this game and get all these exclusives, how are you going to come into my store? Why, if you're just going to buy it online through there? It's the same counter-argument for Amazon and all the other online marketplaces. It's, I get it. Some of these Kickstarters will also have retailer incentives of like, oh, the, those, the companies have actually understood that retailers want these games too, and they'll give them a, a discount or a package deal or mm-hmm. something like that, where, oh, why don't you get people to pre-order in your store, and you'll back it as a store, and we'll just ship it to you, and then you could sell it to them, and everybody's happy. So there, there's definitely some uh, learning curves on it. Usually, uh, one of the biggest things about Kickstarter kind of leans into our, uh, one of our last terms here. Uh, F-O-M-O, FOMO. It's the fear of missing out. You're so much hype generated of, oh my god, this game, this game, this game, that people spend money and buy these games because they don't want to be the one that didn't get it. 
Kickstarter is very much a cultural uh, cultural phenomenon in that developed this. You got to be careful. Play to your budget. Make sure you're you're okay with it. A lot of the time, some of these games are never going to be seen again. You're right. You you might miss out on it. The, a lot of the other ones may actually come to retail. Look at the Kickstarter pages. Talk to the developers that are making it. Ask questions. They usually answer things like that because. If it's something that, hey, they'll be pretty much honest. Like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to publish this after, you know, this Kickstarter. Maybe that's going to be what tips you into backing it. Or, yeah, I'm going to be sending it to retail like three months after I give it to everybody else. And, I mean, it's always a gamble because what may look really good on paper may turn out to be something completely different. We've both had games that we've um, backed on Kickstarter that we've received some are really really good some are okay some look pretty but they're garbage yeah so it, it's it it it's, looks pretty but it plays like garbage yeah oh, it happens it's it's the lottery of board games um and last and by no means the weakest term is flgs friendly local gaming store um, this has been a very endearing term that people have tossed around. If you have a friendly local gaming store, it's a brick and mortar store. Usually it's sole proprietorship, or maybe it's a family run thing, or maybe it's like a small franchise. I've seen those, but they're not your target Walmart, Best Buy, they're Amazon. Not, they're they're not, not. You're not looking at big box people. You can literally walk in. The guy or gal behind the counter is usually the owner, and this is their livelihood. And they usually will give 110% back to the community. They'll host events. They'll have game nights. They'll have tournaments. This is the sort of place that you want to join and be part of if you're in the hobby and want to not only network and make friends, but you'll also be able to try things that you never got to play before because, oh, look, it's board game night. What did this person bring in? Oh, cool. I like that thing. Let's play that. They'll also have a lot of knowledge um, compared to if I walked into Target and I walked up to some random person working there and said, hey, out of all of your board games, what would you suggest? Chances are they're going to give you a blank stare, maybe tell you they've played the game of life for Monopoly, whereas you talk to someone at your friendly local gaming store and they say, hey, look, listen, um, I've had a lot of people come in. They've played this game. Everyone's singing its praises. I'm having a hard time keeping it on the shelf or um, this other game. A lot of them will be so truthful that it doesn't matter whether or not they shoot themselves in the foot. I've had our local, uh, our friendly local gaming shop or gaming store, um, the owner tell me, hey, I can't get you the paint that you want, but go over to this store and they'll have it. Or um, that game, not so great. He's going to sit on that game for as long as it's there until he clearances is out. But he'd rather have happy returning customers versus just throwing whatever at you until you leave the store. Um, they're also not all created equal. Um, it's one of the things I want to talk about in a future episode, too. There's going to be different genres. Maybe the one by you is very focused on Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And they're a magic shop, and that's like their bread and butter. That's what they do. And they kind of have a board game section. Yeah. Or they're the war gaming store. And like, their half of their store is Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, and that's what they do. And then they have some card games and some board games, too. They're all going to have their specialties. They're all going to have their focus. And a lot of that comes from the community that goes there. That does it for this episode. I apologize we're a little long-winded today. There's we get a, passionate about things. There's a lot to go through, too. Um, box I, farts. Box farts. Lots of box farts. So, we're going to leave you with that thought. Think about your friendly local gaming store. And on next episode, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into our that friendly local gaming store concept and talk about types of stores, things, what we like, what we don't like, what we see, what we can do to help support those sorts of organizations. So until next time, let the dice fall in your favor. You've been listening to 
Tabletop Arcanum, hosted by Justin Taylor and Richard Geese, and featuring the original music by Paul Moore and Isaac Gilbert. You can follow us on most social media platforms. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. As always, thanks for listening. Thank you.